so I'm going to talk about machine learning, but with the space-time data, so space-time machine learning. And um, maybe it doesn't sound anything special. Uh, it's just another type of machine learning. But uh, I do think there are some differences. And uh, so I would like to highlight those differences. And I also prepare a data set uh, so we can uh, look at some real data. And we will open the data and uh, look at the problems and things. Uh, and then I want to have a nice discussion. Uh, maybe I will uh, um, see what is your opinion about some topics. Uh, recently, there's been some people very much against extrapolation and things. So I call them extrapolation police. So I'm curious also to hear from you what you think about that. I'm uh, Tom Hengel. I'm a director at Open Hub. I'm also the PI on the Open Net Monitor project, by the way. Um, so I will talk about uh, first a bit intro, uh, my background and what does it mean spatial temporal variable. Then, uh, so you can do spatial machine learning, you can do spatial temporal machine learning. What's the difference? What's really different? And then we look at this uh, Copernicus land monitoring service, GDMP, dry matter productivity. Um, and I will also show you something how to deal with a complex variable skewed variables they get it gets more complex so i'll show you some tricks how you can do this transformation for example then once you uh, generate prediction space time you produce time series uh, data you can do time series analysis to de uh, to uh, uh, derive trends etc and then the last topic is how do you organize sampling design for space time uh, space time modeling how do you do it what's the best sampling design you know, you, you probably did the sampling designs, the spatial statistics, you know, you can do some stratified sampling, random sampling. But how you do sampling design to monitor dynamic variables? That's the question. Okay, some special temporal uh, variables. So you have in environmental sciences, I, I try to kind of cluster them into three groups. There are some variables, they don't really change. For example, relief, elevation, they do change, everything changes. You know, the the famous Greek philosopher says the only thing uh, which is uh, uh, constant is the change. It's a play of words. Um, only thing certain is change. Um, and um, Heraclitus, I think. So everything changes, but some things, you know, if we look last 30 years, there's there's no point to do some modeling, dynamic model because they're quite, fixed, for example, geology, pirate material, um, also some soil properties, you know, they, they are static, they don't change so much. Then you have something which changes moderately, like for example, NDVI, soil organic carbon, it changes on a scale on five years, 10 years. Um, and then you have variables which are highly dynamic. It means they change every 10 centimeters, soil moisture, temperature, you know, all the thing is meteorology that's quite dynamic. And so you need to really uh, measure it every every basically minute. Um, I, I'm like, ever since I did my PhD, I did a lot of spatial statistics, geostatistics. And this is something I've been running in 2005. I started using in R, GSTAT, geostatistical package. So you have a, you know, you have a number of samples and you can do this universal Krieging and you produce from samples, you produce, um, this is a zinc concentration in log scale. I use a log scale, otherwise you won't, it's difficult to see contrast. And then um, about eight years ago, I I used random forest to with the distances to see how that works. And I got a quite similar, you get a quite a similar result. So it's a, uh, it, it's a, a it's a, very similar spatial structure, you know, the spatial dependence and things. So then I was amazed how machine learning actually you could use it to replace geostatistics. And I had these talks, uh, I had some couple of talks, I call them a uh, Krieging killer. So um, it uh, machine learning can replace things. And today you see the machine learning and AI slowly replacing many things, replacing, you know, when you want to write something, when you want to um, uh, speed up some analysis. So. So it happens in many fields, but something I discovered, I, I published a paper on that and 
uh, many people cite it. Uh, it's like a thousand citations. Um, the other thing about dynamic uh, variables, uh, they have these components of variation. Um, and this is a field of actually time series analysis. So you can decompose. So this, this is the original signal, for example. This is the original signal. Uh, but you can decompose it. And so in this case, this signal is decomposed into three components. This is a classical time series analysis. So you have this, what they call a trend. Uh, then you have a seasonal component. You see it's very regular. Seasonal component is very simple, actually. Uh, and then you have the random component. Um, we actually think there's two components. One is the uh, component which is due to some kind of a chaotic behavior or some or some process which is not visible. And, and there is the pure noise. So the random component has two subcomponents. One is, so it's actually not random, but you just don't know what the process is, unknown process uh, or chaotic process. And you have the pure noise and pure noise is measurement errors, etc. cetera. Uh, so these are the standard components. And um, these uh, components I will show you, we try today, we, we try to model them like using functions or mathematical models really because they they as you can see from this graph they are quite they're quite simple actually so so you want to model them uh using um models for example of earth curvature etc um so that's the that's the let's say four four components and they will come now in the modeling when we do this gdmp modeling i will show you these components we'll literally look at them and you will see that we do model them with the machine learning. Uh, but we, of course, we don't want to model uh, pure noise. Uh, pure noise is something you don't want to fit. Uh, pure noise is a residual, so you, you definitely don't want to model it because we assume it's uh, uh, totally, spatially, and temporally independent. Um, also, to uh, talk about these variables, for example, let's talk about temperature. And... Uh, if you look at the, the, the temperature as a variable, uh, you think like it's a one thing, but uh, depending how you aggregate it in space and time, you can have, for example, a hourly temperature, every minute temperature at the station, at the point support, then you can aggregate that hourly temperature and you produce a day daytime temperature or monthly temperature. And then you can aggregate it further on a spatial scale. So you can have a monthly one kilometer resolution temperature. Then you can aggregate up to a year. So you said this is the annual temperature and you can go further. And you can say, well, I just need a one number, a global mean annual temperature. That's all, it's all temperature, but actually that's all different maps, right? Is <laughs> when you conceptualize it, that's all really different things. And probably you have to measure and model several of these things, you do it independent. You can maybe aggregate some things. Um, and then also what's interesting when you say temperature, well, you can have a minimum maximum temperature average, you can have a standard deviation of temperature. So you can also model standard deviation of temperature. It's a kind of another variable. Then you can have a land surface temperature, that's what you get from MODIS, but you can have a, a air temperature. So that's two meter above surface. It's not the radiation of the surface, but it's the air temperature. That's what they do usually in meteorology. And then you have a nighttime and daytime temperature. Night times and days are very different. So you have a jump, it's a bifurcation. In nighttime, the temperatures drop, you know, 10, 15 degrees. So you have a big bifurcation. The difference between daytime and nighttime can be bigger than difference between, I don't know, three months. So, uh, so these are all, so actually when you look at these variables, they're actually quite complex. And um, and this one is this so this is the let's say kind of a global annual temperature, but going back eight thousand years. And this one you just they just display this anomaly. So you see we had we had a period when the Earth is actually was cooling a bit. It was cooling a bit, and now it's the hockey stick. And this hockey stick, this is correctly visualized. So you see this cooling. There was a cooling process, looks quite steep, you know, but it's because we exaggerated. We put plus, plus minus 0 0.2 degree. We exaggerated a bit. So, and because we exaggerated, now we have one degree warming and it's way outside. 
So that the way to understand the global warming, the only way you can do it is to really visualize the global annual temperature for the last 10,000 years, let's say. Then you understand that how, how big is this uh, global warming effect. So this is just the temperature. Okay, so then uh, back in somewhere in 2000, so in 2005, I started doing 2D geostatistics. So just this universal Krieg and things. Then I started doing 3D geostatistics, also soil depth. And then I started doing um, uh, space-time geostatistics. And I started, I made a package called PlotKML also to visualize space-time data. So this is a foot mouth disease data. And usually how do you visualize it in statistical computing environment? You create a series of plots which have all uh, different dates, usually standard dates like monthly or something. And so that's the, the way you visualize it, but you can also visualize it. I made this package so you could make it into, uh, for example, Google Earth, um, and then you will visualize it um, as a, with a time slider, you visualize how things change. And then um, when you conceptualize this, when you conceptualize this, the, uh, the thing we visualize in a space-time statistic is a space-time cube. And what you see here, this is the actual measurements. This is the stations, meteorological stations in Croatia. And I visualize latitude, longitude, and the time. I put the time as a vertical, so you get the space-time cube. And this is just visualizing the points. You see some at some st uh, stations, I don't have uh, temperatures through whole year. Maybe some, there's some missing data, I don't know. Maybe I subset it. But it shows you these points. And because these are static, these are stations, so the points are always the same. The, the latitude long is the same. You just have measurements through time. And then you have also space-time support. You have these space-time blocks. So you can predict, for example, one by one kilometer and then one month. So you have a one kilometer by one kilometer by one month. The relationship between time and space is non-existent. So you cannot, it's not a metric system. It's not, I just fake it here. I make it like a 3D. But actually, the you know one one um, one scale here in the time it doesn't relate anyway in the space, right? So you have to create your own scale. You have to pick up a scale. So it, you could have here seconds, days, you know, um, months, but it doesn't relate with the with the space. So it's provisional. And so we made this paper with temperatures, and uh, we did that is space time um space-time universal creating or regression creating and we published that paper back in 2012 so and that was something okay uh, great and as output you can see we create a time series of predictions so these are the values the same thing as i showed you with the 2d you know you have a zinc values and here you have a temperatures at stations and we use modis land surface temperature as the main covariates and we can predict then um, every month, I think, or this is uh, B-monthly, I don't know. B-monthly, we predict um, the temperatures. And then you can see the interpolation with using geostatistics. I had to fit the space-time variograms and things, and I had to fix this, um, the uh, distance in, uh, in variogram in space and distance in time and the cross distance. So it's a bit of a... Um, it's a bit of work, but you can read that paper and that explains how to do the space-time geostatistics. Uh, and then I also teach that uh, I I wrote this uh, little manual in uh, in R on the doing uh, interpolation in in space, in space-time, and 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 also 3D plus time. So you have both the depths and the and the four dimension of time. Uh, so that was uh, something we made and. And then this uh, 3D plus time, 3D plus time, I don't call it 4D, you know, some people call it 4D. For me, 4D is like some science fiction, you know, you have three space dimensions and the fourth space dimension. Conceptually, they define it in math, there's a fourth spatial dimension. But this thing is a 3D plus time. So you have this space-time cube and you move, you move through time. And uh, we got this data set from US uh, and we did this 3D plus time. And that time I noticed, uh, <laughs> let's try something else 
So we started using random forest. So that's back in 2015. Uh, we started using random forest. And uh, so how did we do it with the random forest? So these are the, this is the one farm in, uh, in uh, Washington state. And, um, and they had these fixed stations and they have a sensor network, so automated sensor network. And it had the four depths that they put it in the soil. They had 45 stations. They put it in the soil and they have it four depths and they measure uh, four variables, uh, including temperature, moisture, electrical conductivity. Um, and so they measured all these variables. And it's only 45 station, but they came with 25 million measurements or something. Because if they measure every hour and you have a four depths, 45 stations, and every hour, uh, over two years, you create millions of measurements, even though it's only 45 uh, geographical locations. Uh, so and so you see the number of locations and also number of prediction locations uh, it goes exponentially up so if you have a 2d system you have to fit only three variable parameters and you have ns locations to predict then if you have a, a 3d so you have also depth then you have uh, for example uh, if you have four depths and you multiply by four so if you have here, for example, 1,000 pixels, so you have a four times 1,000 pixels. And then you have, with the space time, so you have a 1,000 pixels by four depths. And then, for example, you do, you predict daily, so you have 365. So you have a lot of pixels to predict. So this is this 3D plus time. And the time is because you have a predictions, two, two pixels. Now, actually, now when you have the, with the depth, it's voxels. So you have two voxels, and then you have a two voxels next moment. Um, and uh, so this is the one station, multiple depths. These are the depths, 30 centimeters, 60 centimeter, 90, 120, 150. And you can see the water content over three years. You see how it changes. It's very seasonal. Again, there's a seasonal component. And I fitted this. This is kind of a smooth line. I fitted using spline, so just to visualize that. Um, and so we predicted then this daily water content, and uh, this was the general uh, formulation. So we had trend component, we have the uh, residual component, spatially correlated, and we had the pure noise. Uh, so that with the, the, the three components, and then uh, this is how it looks in the code, actually nothing special, except we use this cosine function to present this seasonality. Because at that site, we know that there's a seasonality, as you see from this uh, plot here, uh, there is a seasonality in the variation, and we represented with the, with the cosine function. I just came up to it and I said, okay, we just put this cosine function, uh, and, it, and I tried it and it really fits nicely to this seasonality because it's only at that location. And this is the model, so you do a, a uh, random forest, you have water wave or water, uh, water content uh, is a function of static variables and dynamic variables. And then also this uh, C, C days T, so that's transformed uh, days, cumulative transformed days. C, C is from cumulative, then you have days and the T it's transformed. So C day T, and that's the formula. Okay, so we fitted that and we created predictions and it was difficult to visualize. I had to make in Google Earth these cubes and things and it was uh, actually small data set, but a lot of, in a space-time uh, uh, cube, a lot of pixels. And uh, this is just to show you also some of the variables we discovered that are static. For example, elevation didn't change in three years. There's no need to put elevation. You know, it's a, we call it a static variable. Uh, then uh, some some of the variables they change through time, but interestingly, these variables they were uh, fixed in space, but they change in time. If you can understand it, because this precipitation we got from the meteorological station, so for all the pixels is a one value, but it changes every day, right? So you have some variables that change only in time, and some only change in space. They are fixed in time. Um, and then some change through depth. So we also had soil variables and they change to depth. So it's a like, really, it's a complex uh, regression uh, system where you have uh, variables that change only in time, only in space, 
in space time and also in space time in depth. And we, we fitted that and we, we made these uh, maps and um, it's a nice paper, you know, we really work on this and I'm really proud of this work actually, because we deal with many issues. And also we discovered that uh, if you use random forest, you can heavily overfit, overfit and also uh, to do a validation uh, at the first instance, we had the space-time training points, but at first instance, we randomly subset the points and we got the R square of 0 0.92 at the cross-validation. But when we took the whole stations out, so the 45 stations take the whole station out, so all the times measurements, then the accuracy was only 0 0.60. So huge difference. So we discovered that if you, uh, machine learning can kind of learn if these locations, they are the same, then many values repeat. So the machine learning predict much easier uh, values of the water vapor. And that's not a realistic measure of the accuracy. So the true accuracy is more like 0 0.60. And so that was a nice thing we did. And then we said, okay, let's do this uh, space-time machine learning for many applications. And since then we apply this space-time machine learning uh, for many, uh, many type of data, land cover, soil carbon, uh, meteorological data, daily rainfall. Uh, so we applied it to many type of variables. And what they learned over the years is that difference between space and space time is number one, you have to do uh, accurate space time overlay. So if you say, I want to correlate um, the water content, I want to correlate with the daily rainfall, you have to match when you observe the water at which day you observe it, you have to match in the in space and in time and the support you have to match. And then you do the space time overlay. The second thing we also use now increasingly what we call a special temporal covariates. We create this special uh, temporal covariates. So usually most of the data for the training of machine learning is space time machine learning it has to be time series data. And we also use the data that represents cumulative effects. And what is a cumulative covariate? I will show you some examples. Um, and then also we uh, use this machine learning where we do subsetting by taking the whole stations out. So we don't get this over optimistic uh, estimate of accuracy. So these are the three things that you have to be careful with uh, when you switch from spatial to spatial temporal machine learning. Um, this is just to show you this, uh, you have static. So these are the static, the uh, the dynamic uh, covariates, so X variables, they're usually time series. So it's also space time cube. And you have to overlay space, you have to match in the space and in the time. And then you bind the static ones and the dynamic, you bind it and you get a space time regression matrix. And this space time regression matrix, then you can fit uh, machine learning. And that's what I did. I, I prepared a data set. I will show you that, how we did that. Now, about the cumulative variables. Uh, so if you, for example, look at the precipitation, uh, you can have annual precipitation and you can start counting a zero moment. For example, uh, it could be a beginning of the year uh, or it can be some year, for example, year 2000. And you have an annual a precipitation or you have a monthly precipitation. And so what you do, you you uh, compute a cumulative precipitation. Yeah? And so some places, for example, that recently are, are getting less rainfall, this cumulative curve, it can go up and down, right? If there's no change, then the cumulative curve goes like straight up. It's just, it just linear function. But if it's if it's changing, then it can go up and down. So you have this variable that process that represents basically a, a accumulation of some processes. Okay, so you, you plug in variables, which we call special temporal variables, and they represent this accumulated effects. So going through the whole space-time cube, what is the cumulative effect of rainfall? Uh, then when you have a cumulative rainfall, you can derive also first derivative and second derivative. Then you can derive these derivatives with a search window. You can do a, a, a first derivative with the first neighbor, 
or you can do a derivative based on last five years or last 10 years. So you can play with all these things. And actually you can have, a I estimated you can have an infinite number of covariates because it's an infinite number of things you can do with cumulative uh, values. So, but of course you don't, you don't have to do that and I'm not doing it with the data I'll show you. I usually uh, prepare about two or three cumulative variables, more than half of the variables are time series data and I have some static variables and you have to put also static variables because they don't really change. Um, and, but in, in a, in a effect of this thing that you can have, when you have a spatial problem, you will have just a, oh, okay, a annual precipitation. Suddenly when you have a space time machine learning, you have a cumulative precipitation and you have different derivatives. So you go to tenfold more covariates easily. Uh, so you, it becomes a more, a bigger and bigger uh, data. Okay. So we have this, uh, Copernicus dry matter productivity product and we use that in the open net monitor, we would like to make the data more usable. And so the first thing we did, uh, we downloaded the data, it's a 10 day product, and we downloaded it and we created, we just computed uh, monthly and bi-monthly products. And we notice when we do a, when we do a monthly product, then it's quite okay, you, you have very little gaps. There's still some gaps, but very little. However, if you look at the winter months, you will see that there's still huge gaps. We have huge areas, we don't have any GDMP. Most likely here, the GDMP is close to zero because it's no, I don't know. But we don't know, we don't know. And also you can have them in Sahara. So, and you can have them maybe somewhere in tropics because there's there could be there's a missing value because, because of the clouds or something. So, so we don't know. And so um, in this case, for example, here we have many missing values. We don't know what is a GDMP. And this makes the usability of this data limited, right? Even though it's a very important variable GDMP, uh, it's in um, kilograms per hectare per day or something or grams per hectare per day. It's a very important variable. It's a really primary productivity. Um, so we don't know. So what we want to do is we would like to uh, uh, fit a model to gap fill this GDMP. Okay, we like to gap fill the GDMP. And then what do I use to do that? I use the space-time machine learning. And I look at, first I look at, looking at the variable, I know that the GDMP most likely varies, most of the variance, most of the variation, it's monthly seasonal variation. The variation between uh, years is much less and also long-term variation, probably not on the scale of like what uh, Copernicus has 2014 to 2024. So now it's a 10 years of GDMP. Maybe the variation on long-term is not so big. The biggest component of variation is the seasonal variation. But this seasonal variation, because it's a global product, now it gets more complicated. It's not like this Cook Farm data set. This variation, it's, it's uh, very different in, you know, Brazil, Winter time in Europe is the summer time in Brazil. And so it's, it's way more complex. So how do we model that? So the assumption is we want, uh, so we want a, a space time machine learning model so we can fill in the gaps. And we would like to have a more simple possible model. So we don't want something complex because this is just to do gap filling. So we want something as simple as possible. Uh, and it should be based on a covariates which are exhaustive. So they have no gaps. None of the covariates can have any gaps. They have to be completely exhaustive. Uh, and it needs to be, we need to also have some training data to fill in that model. Uh, and also we want to incorporate some knowledge. So we want to incorporate what I call geophysical theory, right? Because this GDMP, of course, is a result of uh, biophysical processes, photosynthesis. So it's connected with the, uh, you know, duration of the uh, day, um, the incoming uh, radiation, etc. So, uh, so we we look at this. Um, what do we use to train? And we find this uh, uh, data set we uh, where we use to uh, build also models to uh, predict potential and actual FAPAR. Uh, which is a similar variable as GDMP, just a more more like um, um, just a ratio type of variable. 
And uh, so uh, in that paper, we created a sampling design uh, where we uh, allocated about 14,000 locations. And in these locations, we overlay them and we collected data from the FAPAR uh, total 10 million because now it's going from space to space time because it's a monthly values. And also we have a, a quantiles for FAPAR. We have a 5%, 50%, 95% quantile. So we created about 10 million points, space time points, right? And we created this, this data set looks like this. Uh, and I, I have it, it it's a really nice uh, design because the we use an equal area projection. This is this uh, uh, good homolozine um, uh, interrupted projection. It's, a, it's relatively close to equal area. So the density of points across the world is the same. And we also allocate the points um, to different land cover categories, and we allocate them to uh, based also on the variance. So some places where we have a higher variance of upper, we have more points. So it's a very intelligent uh, spatial design, right? And once you have these points, then you can overlay and you create uh, you create this uh, matrix. So I can show you now how this looks like uh, just very quickly, these points. So here's in my R session. I have a couple of these uh, packages. Um, and uh, I, I would just now read these points because I'm not going to show you how to do space-time overlay, but uh, my colleague Serkan, uh, he prepared. Yes? Yes, yeah, sure, yes. Yeah, it's a workshop, yeah. This one? Okay. Uh, yeah, so, sorry to interrupt you. A couple of questions. So you started from... Uh, let's say classical geostatistical approaches and then yes. you move into into machine learning yes. um the spatial and temporal uh, process in machine learning are indirectly captured by the the algorithm while in the in classical machine learn um, classical geostatistic you actually specify these uh, these aspects in your experience uh, the um, Having a meaningful covariance is it successful, uh, sufficient? Sorry to uh, capture these uh, special temporal trends, or uh, we still need to make a couple of steps further to. Yeah, in the in this example, uh, GDMP, I will show you okay. the model I fitted. It's it's actually a very simple model, okay. and I get almost R square, you know, zero point eighty five. Yeah. So it, it explains the you know large chunk of variation. So residuals are minor. Okay. You know, and residuals I can test they are uncorrelated. Okay. And that for me it's enough if the R square is relatively high and if residuals are uncorrelated it means you dealt with the spatial temporal relationships, you know. They are kind of represented in the covariates and you prove it with the model. Okay. So, so okay, but, you, but you, you do have to test it, you know, you cannot okay. ignore it. So Okay. Thanks. So I'm coming. I'm coming to that. So so here's this uh, space time uh, model, and you see I, I load it into uh, R, and uh, it says here. Let's take take see what we have. So uh, 1.8 million, 1.9 million. So it sounds a lot, you know, 1.9 million. But remember, it's only 14,000 uh, locations. Uh, every location has a unique ID. So every I call them stations. You know. So so you see this one repeats. It's one. So that's all one point. So point number one, and this point has many, many repetitions in time. And it has also uh, three quantiles. And the target variable is the GDMP. That comes, that's the Copernicus GDMP, right? There's the values, and these values, you see, says 36, 96, I don't know. And these values, we also know the quantile. So we know if the quantile is 50, uh, 25, or 75. So we know, for, for example, this first one is the 50 quantile, value is 36. The 75 quantile is 96, much higher. And uh, and then this one is another 25, but I see actually higher number. So that's interesting. But so these are the these are the uh, quantiles, but it could be the different times. This, this is all year. Uh, oh yeah, the month, you see this is month March, and this is month uh, January. So we know the, the month, the year, we know the quantile, we know the latitude, longitude, they are fixed for the same stations. And we have uh, we have a couple of other variables. We have a land cover. So we know land cover for every year. Uh, and we know elevation. 
So we have elevation. Elevation is fixed. As I said, that's a static variable. Um, and then we have a, a temperature mean max, which is based on geometric temperature. Uh, we have also night lights. We have water vapor. Uh, my colleague Rolf uh, calculated the water vapor for whole world, one kilometer resolution uh, for the last 23 years monthly. So we can overlay. And this water vapor, it's uh, independent. It's an atmospheric product. So it has nothing to do with the sensing of the land. It's an independent product. And we have precipitation from era five. Uh, my colleague Rolf, uh, sorry, my colleague Serkan uh, calculated the era five monthly uh, 10 kilometer precipitation. It's to me, it's the, probably the best steel precipitation product. And here's the uh, accumulated interannual accumulated precipitation. And this is the long term accumulated precipitation with a log transformation because the values become very high. So we decided to not to have, you can have like a hundred million, you know, if you keep on summing up precipitation. So we decided to just do a log, log 1p. So these are the variables in this space-time regression matrix. Um, and as you see, if I look at the number of unique locations, actually it's a bit less than 14,000. I only have 12,000, 12 and a half thousand. I'm not sure why, probably they drop because we have some missing values. Um, and I can maybe uh, convert this uh, land cover, I can convert it into classes. And so here the classes we have, basically some of the classes, they are a bit more frequent like class eight, almost uh, 300,000. And some classes are less frequent, but in general, because we have this sampling design, distribution of classes is relatively uh, relatively, cons uh, relatively matching the uh, distribution of classes uh, on the land mask. Um, and then I can do the, I can subset to the complete values. There's 16 points. I don't have some values I miss, so I cannot model, so I remove that. Uh, and then I, I here I will do like a ranger. I can fit a random forest model. Uh, this ranger actually, even though it's uh, fast implementation, if I will fit it now, I will fit it because it's a 1.8 million points. It will take about five minutes or something. So I'm not going to do it, uh, but it's possible to fit it. And here I got the R square 0 0.87, right? So I just commented out. Uh, but let's let's take a look at some. Uh, we can do some uh, simple visualization. So what I like is this open air package in R. It has this really nice compact functions to plot this space time data, especially station data, open air. There's a there's a whole book uh, how to use it. So here is a nice scatter plot. So I take now this 1.8 million points, and I say I would like to see how. Uh, what is the relationship between GDMP um, and, for example, uh, geometric temperature? So I have this geometric temperature, and I see, oh, there's there's some there's some systematic distribution, which is amazing when you think about it, because um, because when you when you look at this uh, original data, that's the original data, right? So you see that it is. For example, the GDMP is correlated with the land cover. So we have tropical jungles and things, it's much higher. Um, and it's a, and it's a correlated maybe with the elevation, uh, but it looks like it's strongly correlated also with geometric temperature and especially the tree, the tree cover class, land cover, tree cover. Uh, it's very clearly, uh, it has kind of like a peak on uh, some temperature. Uh, and then uh, stagnates or goes down. And here also on the bare areas, it goes down faster. So here it's kind of stagnates, it goes faster. So it's interesting how this GDMP changes with the different land cover categories. So very nice way to plot these data. How would they plot 1.8 million points, you know, to see some patterns? It's really no joking when you have the space time problems. So this open air, you see the plot is very simple. It just says scatter plot, and you say this is my target, and uh, you can put a log log on the so also to see better, and uh, and also as a type. So type uh, in this case type is to split the the variables. Um, then the other thing I can plot also is the. Uh, 
uh, this one. Uh, this is just a one station, also very nice uh, functionality. And uh, so we can see visually how these things correlate. So we have the GDMP. You see here for some year, the 2021, like something's happening. I don't know for this point, um, the, the value is a bit smaller. So it could, I don't know what it could be. Maybe it was a fire or some uh, drought or something, but something's happening. Maybe it's a change in the in the land use system, and um, and you see the the uh, the geometric temperature, and then precipitation. Precipitation also variable. This one is uh, basically should be actually totally symmetric, um, and maybe there's a there's a missing point. There's a missing point here. Yeah, so it cuts it here. So it looks like it's different, but it's actually a missing point here. Uh, so these are the this is just on one station, so I can feed that. And then I do space-time machine learning, nothing special. I use the light GBM. It's very fast, actually. Uh, the only thing before I can fit the model, I would like to emphasize that I don't want to uh, use for the internal training, I don't want to use the same stations. So I have to set up a blocking, what is called a blocking parameter, which is the station ID. So I create that station ID and also the land cover is factors. So I convert it into dummy variables. So here's the dummy variables. Uh, and now I have a, I have a reg space time regression matrix where I have the blocking uh, variable and I have this dummy variables uh, zero one. So each land cover class is a zero one. It becomes zero one. Do you, you know these dummy variables in regression, right? Um, and then uh, I want to check what is the accuracy of that. So uh, I will take 20% of points for the validation and 80% I want to do the training. Um, and so I get this uh, split and now I can um, do the LG, uh, the uh, light uh, gradient boosting. Uh, it's very, it's incredibly fast. So it's like split second uh, and I got the model. Uh, are you using this? Uh, so there's this like really uh, cutting edge today, machine learning frameworks like Renault Forest and uh, light gradient boosting, extreme XGBoost, um, neural nets and things. So one of them, as I said, I use it just here. I like it because it's very fast, it's simple. Um, and uh, I can see the variable importance. So uh, no, no, this is very interesting, this variable process. I didn't know what's going to come out. Uh, so it turns out that the, knowing that the, where the bare areas, the bare areas, knowing that is the most important to uh, predict the GDMP, right? So uh, so let's take a look at that. Uh, and it's also visible here. You see these bare areas is a very different distribution than the other land cover classes. So this bare is a bit, the GDMP is much smaller. So it, it really goes down. So this comes as a, a very important. And then I can predict, now I can predict on these validation points and uh, I predict it. And then I see uh, the RMSC is something 1.25. So that's quite good. Uh, and the last thing I can do is uh, uh, I can do this uh, plot, the accuracy plot. Uh, so we can take a look at that. And uh, accuracy plot also looks uh, quite good. Um, so here's the accuracy plot is the accuracy plot. And I can also look at the correlation plot between each individual. So GDMP and each individual, um, and also between them also how they're correlated. And this is the accuracy plot based on this, taking the whole stations out. So it's a proper cross validation and I get a CCC of 0 0.9. So that's about R square of 0 0.81, okay, or 82. So, and you see there is, the model is quite good. Uh, except here that we have, where we have some places we have a low, so zero GDMP in the product, we have a zero GDMP, we predict, we predict a bit higher. So we overestimate zero GDMPs. And I was looking at it, where does this happen? And this is mainly in the, in the, some desert areas, because in our model, we don't know whether there's a biomass. Our models are purely based on geometric temperature and on the rainfall. So there is a rainfall in desert and there is you know, warm conditions, but actually GDMP is zero. So that's the only place where we predict. 
And th this thing, what you see is, uh, uh, this is this geometric temperature. If you never used it, this is the formula. Basically, it's a way you convert latitude into uh, uh, something which is a sphere geometry. Uh, and uh, this is uh, in, in um, meteorology is used to estimate what will be the temperature just based on the latitude and the day of the year. And we created also these maps. You can download the maps. You don't have to compute it. You can just use it. They are the same. So they they kind of uh, they represent seasonality, which is due to the uh, curvature of the Earth. And also, it uh, elevation is being incorporated. Uh, actually, the, I was looking at also precipitation is geometric. You know, you could also uh, fit a, uh, estimate a model uh, based on the um, basically uh, land mask and a rotation of the Earth. You could probably estimate the uh, precipitation, the component, the systematic component uh, per month. So it's also probably, but I don't have it yet. So we do just use the era five, but most likely you could also estimate this geometric uh, temperature. So that was this GDMP. And as I said, the nice thing is that, yeah, I can really fit the model and this is really uh, robust validation. So you take the whole stations out and I, I tested it a few times and I said, it's ready to go. So we can do the gap filling. So we're going to do that now with the, this model. In reality, unfortunately, the points are not like the ones we have where we have equally distributed points based on complexity of terrain, but we have these flux net towers. And this is what Serkan is now working on. And this is something where it gets really tricky because you have these clusters of points. So there's a spatial clustering and there's some huge gaps. There's, so in tropics, you don't have points. Right, so the question is, can you also do machine learning with that? And uh, also what's important to visualize uh, these points, not only in space, but you have to also visualize them like this. You have to look where these points in time and you can see that, for example, some of these data sets, they stopped in 2015. So you can see the, more, the, best, the best coverage is from uh, 2004, I think, to 2015. But it's not the perfect coverage. But still, this data I would uh, use it for to do space-time machine learning. But you have to be more careful because there's a clustering effect, there's spatial clustering, and there's also some gaps. Anyway, that's uh, uh, Serkan was presenting that I think uh, on the the making the 30 meter resolution GDP. Uh, then we also do this uh, Yeo Jensen transformation. Uh, so it's also a way to solve that problem of uh, very skewed variable. It's very difficult to do machine learning because the high values dominate. Uh, but so we use this uh, automated framework to estimate that. Once you have the time series of predictions, you can do trend analysis. This is a trend analysis for the daytime, nighttime temperature. Land or computed by fitting models for every pixel. And you can see where the red red thing is, it means it's a positive increase in temperature. So there's a really global warming. And, but it's also some places where it's getting cooler. So parts of Canada, it's actually getting cooler, uh, daytime, nighttime. Um, yes, just to finish that, how to organize points. So from everything, I, I don't have time now to go. I have to stop slowly. But I believe that the best system to do monitoring is a hybrid design. Uh, which is a combination of feature space coverage sampling and random space-time sampling. I will put about 50, 50% 50 points. It looks like this. <laughs> Have you ever seen something like this? It it looks like my 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 daughter making some um, uh, a plot. But uh, you see the grid sample, which will be should be uh, not grid, but the feature space coverage sampling, but with repetition in time. Uh, so that will be stations. Um, and this this thing, whole thing is known. I mean, they have this sampling design. So this is a, this is in time. So these are the stations, you know, with the irregular uh, measurement in time. Um, this is the worst possible design. <laughs> have you seen anything like this? So this is the, uh, so this this is the time. It's uh, this this way. Wait, where is the, oh yeah. So you see the time is uh, this way and this is space. So what happens, you have to, there's no fixed stations. There's no fixed station, you have to always move. So it's very expensive. And you need to be at multiple places at the same time. And then, 
you will not be able to validate trends because you don't have measurements through time. So you will never be able to validate the trends. Anyway, with this thing, I stop. It's uh, it's um, lots of things still to discuss. And uh, please, uh, uh, they uh, we publish this little uh, statement in the Nature Communications about whether extrapolation is a good thing. I personally believe that extrapolation is useful and we should be doing it and including we should be doing it in uh, also in space time. So extrapolation is useful. Just make sure you correctly estimate prediction intervals so the, and that you communicate your commu uh, prediction intervals clearly. If you do that, I think you uh, you can do also space-time learning with these flux net points. The alternative is that we say these flux net points, we cannot use them because they have a clustering and gaps. We cannot use them, we cannot do the modeling. So what do we do? We go on holidays, right? So no, we're going to do it. Thank you.